This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I'm speaking to you today not as a historian, but as a Jesuit scientist. I've got the, 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 the clerical collar and the MIT ring. Um, this proves that you can be at the same time both a fanatic and a nerd. <laughs> I'm a fanatic when it comes to my church, and I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to my church, and a fanatic when it comes to science. <laughs> there, at least once, somebody came up and tried to kiss the ring. <laughs> I'm a pro. Um, because I'm not myself a historian, I've had to rely on the work of other historians. I put up here two of the books that I've relied on a lot. One is a new book on the Jesuits of the Church by Augustin Lodias, which I was fortunate enough to see a preliminary English version of because my Spanish is not that strong. And I'm thinking this is going to be coming out in the next year or so. It's a marvelous book and I highly recommend it, especially if you read Spanish, but wait a year, maybe you can read it in English. The other is La Specula Vaticana, which is the history of my own observatory, the Vatican Observatory, written by Sabina Maffeo, whose office is next to mine. So it's easy enough to get details from him. I've also borrowed some material from another person at the Vatican Observatory, Dr. Eliana Kenichi, who is a historian of science at uh, the University of Palermo. I'm the person in charge of audiovisuals. She gave a talk. She put her talk, our PowerPoint, on my computer, so I've got a couple of nice slides now. <laughs> my plan here is to give a couple of thumbnail sketches of various Jesuit scientists, you know, looking over 400 years, working on every continent, working in fields of anthropology to seismology, and I hope that this will allow me to bring into view the rather interesting and particular role that Jesuits have played in the history of science to see if there is anything distinctive that we could say about being a Jesuit scientist. And of course, what all these Jesuit scientists have in common is that they're all Jesuits. <laughs> Our founder, Father Ignatius, it says in his autobiography, the greatest consolation he received was from gazing at the sky and the stars, and this he often did, and for quite a long time. <laughs> Jesuit spirituality is, as Hopkins pointed out, strongly incarnational. We are the society of Jesus. We are dedicated to coming close to Jesus, God's incarnation within this physical universe. The spiritual exercises involve a series of prayers whose common theme is to place and identify God's presence in the physical universe, in specific times, in specific places. And the Jesuit mantra is to find God in all things, not the emphasis on things, the created world. Being close to the created world is taken as a way of getting close to the creator. In addition, the original Jesuits were a group of men who met at the University of Paris. Scholarship was an essential part of what formed them as a society. Their unity of hearts and minds came from being students together. This scholarship at its beginning was at the highest level included expertise of all the subjects of the university, not just philosophy and theology, but also mathematics, music, geometry, astronomy, the, the subjects of the medieval quadrivium. And you see all of this in play in Jesuit scientists. Consider the case of Father Jose de Acosta, born in Spain in 1540, the year that the Jesuit order was founded. He entered the Jesuits at age 13. By the time he was in his 30s, 1572, he was sent to America as a part of the third Jesuit expedition there and stayed there 15 years. He traveled to Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Mexico, and then in 1587 he goes back to Spain where he has a number of university posts, eventually became rector of the Jesuit College of Salamanca, and he dies there in 1600. It was when he came back to Spain that he wrote a number of books about his experiences in the New World, most notably, De Natura Novis Orbis, or On the Nature of the New World, which was a description of the flora and fauna of the Americas, <coughs> written originally in Latin. 
He then translates it into Spanish, and it's the first two books of a set of seven books published collectively as the Natural and, so the Natural and Social History of the Indies. The first three books cover the geography and climate and geology of the Americas. He has descriptions of earthquakes, descriptions of volcanoes. The fourth book, he describes minerals, plants, animals. And then the final three books are about the peoples who he encountered in Peru, in Mexico. <coughs> Simply as a systematic description of the physical and sociological setting of the New World, the book is remarkable enough. But it's more than that. Note, it's written in Spanish. This is a generation before Galileo. This Jesuit author is writing in the vernacular and popularizing science, spreading it to an audience beyond scholars fluent in Latin. And its significance goes beyond that. Godius in his book points out there are a lot of remarkable things in this book. Godius points out that other authors had already written about the new lands of the America, but Mostly, the other authors had just described what they saw, the unusual, the strange things, without trying to understand them. Acosta writes, quote, Till now, I have not seen an author who dares to find the causes and reasons of the new and strange things of nature. Odeus remarks that the new and strange things could not be explained by traditional Aristotelian philosophy. And in Acosta's words, they are natural things which fall outside the generally accepted philosophy. The generation before Galileo, he's already come up with two huge things, pillars of modern science. For example, he talks about the abundance of water and vegetation in the American torrid zone. Now, Aristotle knew that there was a desert at the equator, an impassable desert, because that's what the Sahara was. And Aristotle then concludes that this is naturally the way that the universe ought to be. And here we are in South America where there's no desert, there's a jungle. So Acosta says of Aristotle, he was a great philosopher, but he was wrong on this point. Among his subjects, he discusses the origin of the trade winds. We now know the trade winds are tied to the rotation of the Earth. Acosta didn't believe in the rotation of the Earth. He attributes them to the motions of the celestial spheres, which is really the same thing, just with a different change of, of reference point. Acosta notices that the tides are uniform in both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, and he attributes this to the action of the moon, something that Galileo didn't get right. He was among the first to describe altitude sickness. He was in Peru. Most notably, he was the first person to suggest that the indigenous peoples in America originated from Asia and came to America via some kind of land bridge. This was long before the Bering Straits had been discovered. That same epoch was the time of the great Gregorian reform of the calendar. The actual reform was not due to a Jesuit. It was a layperson, Luigi Lelio. But it fell to a Jesuit, the young Christopher Clavius, born in 1538, lived till 1612. Clavius was the one who wrote the book that outlined and explained and justified the reform. That book came out in 1602. Clavius is notable. Not only as an expert and innovator in mathematics, he was the guy who populated, popularized the use of the decimal point, but he was also famous as an expert in the teaching of mathematics, which became part of the Ratio Studiorum. Notably, as a, an older professor and well-established, he wrote a letter of recommendation for a young Galileo. Galileo didn't get the job. <laughs> The Jesuits were originally among Galileo's supporters, but the rivalry for precedence in Galileo's own prickly personality eventually led to a falling out between the Jesuits and Galileo, most notable in this regard was the dispute between Galileo and Father Orazio Grassi, born in 1583, which makes him about 20 years younger than Galileo. The two of them argued about the nature of comets. Grassi was the first person to observe a comet to 1618 
with a telescope, something that Galileo never did. He was sick that year. Grassi compares the position of the comets that he observed with positions observed by other Jesuit colleagues in Germany. That's what that plant fancy chart over there is about. <laughs> and both the Jesuits in Germany and the Jesuits in Italy see the comet going past the same star at the same time on the same night, which is to say there is no parallax from one position to another, which is to say that the comet is out in space, farther away from us than the moon. And that is difficult to reconcile with the Copernican system, because the Copernican system still worked with circular orbits. And there, weren't, there wasn't enough room to put a circular orbit and have a comet out that far and then come as close to the Earth as it does. So for the next four years, Galileo and Grassi are arguing in a series of, of, of dueling booklets about do comets of orbit in space or are they some kind of local phenomenon? Ultimately, Galileo writes his great masterpiece, The Assayer, his masterpiece in the philosophy of science. He's writing in Italian. He's a phenomenal writer. He's full of wit. He's full of charm. He makes Grassi look like a total idiot for quoting the ancients because, after all, how science should be done is not to rely on the authority of some ancient sages, but on the data. And incidentally, without actually having any data, comets can't possibly be out in space. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> the whole Galileo story is beyond the scope of this paper. Suffice to say here that as a result, the Copernican system, which had been around for about 80 years without causing any trouble in the church, Galileo comes along and pushes it, and suddenly the Copernican system is, is thrown into great suspicion. But it's important for us to remember that in 1615, there were a lot of scientific problems with the Copernican system, <coughs> problems that actually wouldn't be solved until you left Copernicus in circular orbits and go into Kepler's uh, elliptical orbits. The scientific evidence that we now know is there to support the Copernican system wasn't around in most of the 17th century. Jesuit scientists were among those who worked the hardest to examine the Copernican cosmology from a scientific point of view. And probably the most notable is Giovanni Battista de Cioli, born in 1598, you know, 15 years younger than Grassi, lived till 1671. He worked in Italy. He wrote this book um, as a member of the Society of Jesus, less than 20 years after the Galileo trial. And he organizes on a scientific basis a series of 80 arguments for and against, against the Copernican system. The problem is that observations of planets alone could not tell the difference between a system where the sun is in the center and the earth and all the planets go around the sun, or the Tycho Brahe system where the earth stands still, the sun goes around the earth, but all the other planets still go around the sun. Because really they're identical systems except for a, a, a change of, of origin point. The only kind of evidence available was to see is there any evidence that the earth is moving and in the middle of the 17th century, there was no evidence. You could not see any parallax of stars, stars moving back and forth, because it turns out they were so far away that they didn't know that. You could not tell from looking for something that we would now call the Coriolis force, the motion as you go north or south ever so slightly, you know, the thing that makes water supposedly go in a spiral down your, your tub. That was not visible, that was not measurable in the 19th century. There was no evidence to support the idea of a moving Earth. And he works out all of this, this balance between the two systems in this book at great length from a scientific point of view and comes to the conclusion, which is of course the conclusion the, the, the church wanted to hear, that the Tycho Brahe system with this, uh, this non-moving Earth fits the data better than the Copernican system. And the nature of the data was true. On the other hand, this book is also famous because Riccioli has the first 
modern telescopic map of the features on the moon using the nomenclature that we still use today. And what is the most prominent crater on the moon? He names it Crater Copernicus. And not only does he name it Crater Copernicus, he names all the other big craters nearby after other scientists who also believed in the heliocentric system. So you've got Crater Aristarchus, Crater Kepler, Crater Galileo, and uh, oh yeah, Crater Riccioli. <laughs> also Crater Grimaldi, who was his uh, instructor. Is this a little secret message? You can argue about that. The point was, scientific work, serious scientific work, was going into understanding which of these systems actually were correct. There's another contemporary of Riccioli that we cannot forget about, Athanasius Kircher. Kircher, born in 1602, the youngest of nine kids. He's 14 when he enters the Jesuits. He comes to the Roman College in 1633, which was the year of Galileo's trial. So he's very aware of what's going on in the world of Galileo. Now, I have read more than once uh, statements to the effect that after the Galileo trial, all science stops in Catholic Europe, which is utter nonsense. Uh, did you ever hear of a guy named Cassini? We've got a spacecraft named for Cassini. But you all hear about a guy named Kircher. Kircher was a great supporter of Galileo's ideas, the new method of philosophy, based on observation and experiment. He was a polymath who was publishing books on hieroglyphics, on magnetism, on sundials, on optics, on acoustics, on music, astronomy, philology, logic, Chinese culture, Roman antiquities. He organizes at the Roman College a museum that comes to be known as the Museum Kircherario all of the little goodies. He was not himself an original scientist so much as someone who would compile and publish the work of others. This was in the era before scientific journals. Scientists publicized their work by writing letters to individuals who act as clearinghouses or distribution nodes for scientific communication. Kircher was one of the best known of these. Another one would be uh, Marin Mersenne, the French friar of the Minim Order, or here in London, Robert Hooke, early member of the Royal Society. Kircher's books are thus a fascinating melange of observations and theories, some of it outstanding, some of it utterly absurd, and he presents all of this generally without uh, evaluation or comment. His duty, he figured, was to communicate the information more than judging it or sensing it but he was a key person of science in the 17th century. A generation later, would you have Roger Boscovich, probably the most outstanding Jesuit scientist and engineering, engineer of his generation. Now, the Jesuits had a general congregation, Congregation 16, in 1731, when Boscovich would have been 20 years old, and it emphasized the need for Jesuit schools to support the Aristotelian system. Because that's what the church wanted. That's what our theology was based on. And of course, the Aristotelian system was the geocentric system. But at the same time, the general congregation also opens the door to the possibility of teaching experimental sciences. And pretty soon, Jesuit schools are using this as an excuse to sneak Newton into the curriculum. Because Newton is still fairly new there. But you know, a, a new way of calculating, of, of preserving the appearances of how the universe worked. And this is the system that Boscovich was raised in. When he was a young man, he observed the transit of Mercury, Mercury passing in front of the face of the sun which happened, doesn't happen all that often, but it happened in 1736. As a result of this, he was later very active in promoting similar, tra observing similar transits of Venus, which we'll talk about, 1761 and 69. Actually, he got his biggest fame originally while in Rome, working out how to fix the crack in the dome of St. Peter's. And he proposed the fix, they did it, and it fixed the crack. This makes him famous. 
as a result of the good odor that he has as a genius, he has the ear of people at the Vatican, and he starts working on them to rescind the, uh, the prohibition against teaching heliocentrism. <coughs> Finally, that occurs in 1757. But probably he's most famous for a book of Theoria Philosophiae Naturalis, the Theory of Natural Philosophy, 1758. It's generally considered the origin of the modern atomic theory of matter. And that's probably what you'll see him most quoted for today. But I mentioned uh, this, of course, is evidence of how quickly Jesuits were happy to adopt the heliocentric system. This is a ceiling of the mathematics room at the Jesuit College in Prague, painted in 1760, just three years after it's legal to do so. We have all of these little angels using telescopes to look at <laughs> the sky. The sky is full of stars, and every star has planets and comets in orbit around it. <laughs> <laughs> so, among the things that Boscovich did was to promote observing the transits of Venus in 1761 and 69. And these were probably the most important scientific achievement of the 18th century. What's, what's the deal? If you've got Venus, most of the time it's moving between us and the sun, but a little bit above or a little bit below. It's only twice every 120 years that it actually crosses across the disk of the sun. And um, Edmund Halley worked out that you could use these observations to work out the size of the solar system. <coughs> but of course, they weren't going to be available when Halley was alive. They had to wait another 50 years. Here's the way it works. My head is the sun. Here's Venus, a little, little dot going across the top of the sun. People in the back of the room see that it goes across, oh, let me do this way. People in the back of the room see that it goes across my chin. The people in the front of the room will see it going across a different part of my face. If you compare how long it takes to cross the sun, you've got two cords. You can work out the size of the sun, and you can work out the distance between the two cords in terms of angles. But that angle is similar to the actual physical distance between you and you. So if I have one person in India and another person in Sweden observing the same thing at the same time, I can know the distance between India and Sweden, know the distance in terms of the two different chords, work out the size of the sun in terms of miles and kilometers. And from the size of the sun in terms of angles, I now know how far away the sun is. This is the basis of every other measurement we make in astronomy. By knowing the size of the astronomical unit, we can then use the very, very tiny parallax we finally can see among stars to work out how far the stars are. From knowing the size of the nearest stars, we can see how star brightnesses of, of uh, Cepheid variables change. In, and then you observe Cepheid variables in nearby galaxies, and you work out how far away the galaxies are. And from these, you then work out how, how far away uh, clusters of galaxies are. Ultimately, the whole Hubble constant, our entire understanding of the Big Bang, comes is based on this original measurement made in 18, 1761-25% of all the observatories in the world were run by Jesuits. <laughs> Jesuits were important in making these measurements around the world. There's a whole wonderful story about Maximilian Hell going up to Sweden at the invitation to the King of Sweden because he's probably the best observer in Europe at the time, even though it's illegal to be a Jesuit in Sweden in those days. <laughs> this shows you the kind of respect that Jesuit scientists had. Jesuit astronomy continues into the 19th century. There's a lot of work done at the Roman College by uh, Etienne de Mouchel, Francesco de Vico. They were among the first to recover Comet Halley when it makes its next pass through pretty much where you know, Halley had predicted it was going to be. De Vico determines the orbits of Saturn's moons, Mimas and Enceladus. Um, other astronomers show the pole an eclipse of the sun, and he goes, wow, that's cool. <laughs> Always good to have you know, the, the, the sun. But best of all, this work 
lays the foundation for probably the most important of all Jesuit scientists, Pietro Angelo Secchi. Angelo Secchi was born in 1818 in the Reggio Emilia, just northwest of Bologna, enters the Society of Jesus at the age of 15. By the time he's 23, he's teaching physics at a high school in Loreto. 1844, he's back at the Roman College. He's doing theology studies. He's ordained in 1847, 29 years old. So he's got a career ahead of him, teaching physics, being a parish priest, being a priest at a school. Then, 1848 occurs. 1848 was one of tremendous upheaval throughout Europe. In November, Garibaldi's armies enter Rome. Pope Pius IX is forced to flee. And the Jesuits are expelled from Rome by the new Roman Republic. So Secchi is an exile. Where does he go? Stony Earth College. He probably started working in astronomy there at the observatory at Stonyhurst. He was there for six months. By 1849, he moves from Stonyhurst to Georgetown University in the US, where he teaches astronomy for a year. Finally, in July of 49, the French army moves back into Paris. Pius IX is reinstalled in Rome. And a year later, Secchi finally comes back to the Roman College. Vivico, by this point, has died. Secchi, at age of 31, is made the director of the observatory, given that he's now learned from Stonyhurst and Georgetown how to make a telescope work. The first thing he does is to fulfill a dream that Oscovich had had a year before. I don't know how many of you people have ever been to Rome. Have you ever been to the Church of St. Ignatius? Yes. It's the one with the fake dome, right? And you go inside, look at it, it's a pretty cool dome until you look at your book. But wait a minute. And you know the story, they ran out of money, they never built a dome, they put a flat roof. Because it's got a flat roof, but four pillars designed to carry the weight of a dome that's not there, Secchi puts telescopes <laughs> on top of each of those pillars. <laughs> and it's got a wonderful view of the sky. I've been up there, you can see you know, the horizon in every direction. And of course, in the 19th century, you didn't have the worry of, of electric lights. It's from here that Secchi does something in astronomy that completely changes what astronomy is all about. Now here's the thing. Remember what we said, the guys doing astronomy before that they had found and tracked Halley's Comet. They had found and tracked the moons of Saturn. They had found and astronomy was measuring the positions and the motions of stars. That's why they were being paid to do astronomy, because that's what navigators needed, was to know exactly the positions and the motions of the stars. As it happens, in about 1820, Fraunhofer had taken spectra of the sun and the bright star Sirius, and hey, the spectra look funny. But he didn't really understand that at the time, because everybody knows that what astronomers do is not take spectra, because what do we have? it's pretty colors. It doesn't mean anything. What astronomy must do has always been clear. It must lay down the rules for determining the motions of the heavenly bodies. Everything else that can be learned of the heavenly bodies is not properly of astronomical interest. That's Bessel. Bessel functions. He gets Bessel functions named after him. But he gets his trouble wrong. The great French philosopher Comte Every research in relation to stars not reducible in the end to simple visual observations is perforce barred to us. <laughs> we could never study by any means either their chemical composition or their mineral structure. Our positive knowledge concerning the stars is necessarily restricted to just their geometrical and mechanical phenomenon because it is impossible to undertake any kind of physical, chemical, or physiological research. Yeah. <laughs> 1859, Kirchhoff and Bunsen show that the dark lines you see in spectra are telling you something about the gases, the cold gases that the light has gone through. And Secchi immediately follows this up by building a prism 
that big round thing, that fits over the end of his telescope. And so every star that he sees is no longer a dot of light. Have you seen a star in a telescope? It's really boring. It's just a dot of light. Until it's turned into a rainbow. And you can begin to see the little lines missing in some stars and not other stars. Because what Seki does is to systematically observe 5,000 stars. And he starts to classify them by their lines. Some have a whole lot of lines, like the sun. Some have only a few really bright lines, like Sirius. Some have a whole lot more lines in the sun, like uh, Rigel. And then there are some where the lines are in a completely different position than all the other stars but a position that matches the lines you see when you pass light through boiling carbon. And these he names carbon stars. Nowadays, of course, we know that they are carbon stars. <laughs> <laughs> By doing this systematic classification, Seki changes the whole question of astronomy from where are the stars to what are the stars? What are they made of? How did they get that way? Eventually, this is going to lead to the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and that is the basic tool we use today to understand star clusters, star evolution, everything that is done in astrophysics. He starts by doing this. He also studies the sun itself. His expedition to Spain in 1860 was the first one to photograph a solar eclipse. He went on to make enormously detailed observations of sunspots. The drawings in black and white on the left are Secchi's drawings. On the right is a photograph of the best solar telescope we've got in the world today. That's the quality of the work he did. His work also led to the recognition of the connection between solar activity and changes in the Earth's magnetic field, which is now a big project because we worry about the Earth's magnetic field that you know, affects cell phones and affects a lot of things on the electricity we use on Earth. NASA has a stereo spacecraft, two spacecraft, that are in orbit around the sun, observing the sun, and the package that observes the sun-Earth connection coronal and heliospheric investigations S-E-C-C-H-I. <laughs> There's fame. You get an acronym name for you. <laughs> They're never going to do that with Consul Manu, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Seki continues this pattern of asking not only where but what when he observes the planets. He obtains the spectra of the uh, outer planets. He discusses their atmospheres. He describes canals on the surface of Mars, using the word canali, but he's really seeing channels, and the channels he saw, as you can see in that photograph, are real. It's somebody else, it is Scapadelli and Lowell, who invent these thin canals that are figments of the imagination. Secchi's canali actually can be seen with spacecraft. And the catalog of Secchi's work doesn't stop there. He went on to found the first magnetic observatory in Italy, invented the Secchi disk to measure the transparency of the ocean, investigated the origin of hail and other meteorological phenomena. He installed sundials and lighthouses all through the Papal States, surveyed the Appian Way, and then 1870, Rome was finally occupied. His observatory is confiscated by the new Italian government. He gives up his chair of event in astrophysics at the Roman College. The new government knows that he's the most famous scientist in all of Italy, and they offer him all sorts of honors, all sorts of positions, if he will stay on as the chair of the department. But they're an anti-clerical government, and he won't play ball. He risks losing using the observatory, because all of the other church properties are being uh, confiscated. Finally, a, a compromise is worked out with the church, and he is confirmed as the director of the observatory in 1876. Sadly, two years later, he dies. One other Jesuit scientist I want to mention here, James McElwain, born in Point Clinton, Ohio in 1883, one of eight kids. He's 15 years old when he leaves high school because he's got to work on the farm. He eventually 
goes back, finishes his high school education, so he's about 19, 20 before he finishes high school, and then 20, at the age of 20, enters the Jesuit order. He's sent to St. Louis, where he worked as uh, studies philosophy, and he comes across a gizmo called a seismometer, something that measures the shaking of the earth. And he's just fascinated by this. So because he's got some talent in science, he's sent to Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, where he gets his PhD in 1923 with a thesis that discusses the propagation of seismic waves on the surface of the earth. It's the first thesis on seismology in North America. And of course, it's done in Berkeley. Berkeley sits on top of the San Andreas Fault. So earthquakes are a big deal there. He gets his PhD, and he's immediately assigned back to St. Louis, where there aren't any earthquakes. <laughs> but he revives an old outfit that had been around, the, Ge the Jesuit Seismological Association, in 1925, and he resets up a network of modern seismic stations at Jesuit universities across the whole US, and this network stays in operation until 1963. The idea is, if you've got more than one observation of an earthquake, you can triangulate the earthquake arrival times from the Darius stations, work out exactly where the earthquake took place, and then you discover there's a San Andreas fault. But not only that, you can work out the boundaries of where the crust is, where the mantle is, where the core is, and you've got a liquid outer core and a solid inner core. The entire mapping of the interior of the Earth starts with the seismic network at Jesuit schools that he sets up. The other thing you can do is measure the position and strength of underground nuclear tests which becomes so important that when the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is signed in 1963, the US government takes over the network and sets up their own network, and that's where the Jesuit network uh, is. Essentially, though many of those stations are still in operation, it's no longer the Jesuits running them, it's the National Science Foundation. McElwain stayed in St. Louis the rest of his life. He, he lived till 1956. So, okay, it's not a seismic zone. He can still do science there. In his lab, he measures the seismic speed of different minerals, the kind of basic data you need to be able to understand how seismology works and how you can interpret the results of the seismic network. Also, if you've ever been to St. Louis, they don't have many earthquakes, but they sure have a lot of weather. You can get tornadoes coming across from Kansas. You can get hurricanes coming up from the Gulf. He also does a lot of teaching in meteorology. He writes textbooks on both of these topics. As a result, the American Geophysical Union every year awards the McElwainy Medal for outstanding achievements by a young geoscientist. Meanwhile, the American Meteorological Society gives a McElwainy Award for outstanding students in meteorology. Interesting thing changes. At this, around the end of the 19th century. Up to then, Jesuit science had been basically doing the science. But by the end of the 19th century, it's got a new apologetic role. Before then, scientific work had just been something that the clergy did, because in many parts of the world, the only educated person around to, to make these records was the local you know, parish priest. By the 1870s, there are a lot of pressures, both in the secular society and the church, that are putting a strain on the relationship between science and religion. The, the kind of idea of a conflict between science and religion comes out of the uh, Enlightenment anti-clericalism. Their idea that someday science is going to replace religion. Uh, naturally, religion doesn't like that idea. Likewise, the church often has a rather stubborn and um, uncreative, shall we say, way to respond to these enlightenment ideas. The rapid development of technology in the 19th century gives rise to the Whig myth that if you just wait longer enough, electricity and steam engines are going to solve all of our problems. Both of these trends are reflected in the rise of the secular university, especially in Germany, and the status of scientists as an occupation, a professional occupation, not just something that clergymen and wealthy noblemen can do. In America, 
Uh, there's my McElhaney slide, which I should have been showing you that. In America, fueling all of this are the anti-immigration books by people like Andrew Dixon White, the guy who founded Cornell University. He's the one who wrote The History of the Warfare of Science with Theology and Christendom. Basically, he argues that everything good that happens happens in spite of religion, everything bad that happens happens because of religion. But his real theme is that we've got to stop all of those people with vowels at the end of their names, like a consul manual. People who come from Southern Europe or Eastern Europe who are Catholic. We've got to stop them from coming in and diluting our good American blood. <coughs> and as a result of this, there is an Immigration Act in 1924 which puts in really horrific quotas on immigration from the South and the East. Um, 90, the immigration from Italy fell by 90%. All of this is tied into the other science idea of the 19th century, eugenics, which tries to use Darwin's idea of evolution as a way of breeding superior human beings and eliminating the unfit by forced sterilization. And it's really easy to tell who the superior human beings are, but the ones who look like me. <laughs> And this is aligned with social Darwinism, which is the system that says that, why am I rich and you're poor? Well, clearly it's evolution. Clearly it's only natural selection occurring. It would be a violation of nature for me to think that I could ever make you rich. Because if you were going to be rich, you would be rich. And you're not rich. Therefore, you can't be rich. How can you be bad? <laughs> Okay, the church was not happy with any of these things. This was used as evidence that, ah, the church must be against evolution. Ah, the church must be against science. See, I told you so. Well, how did the church respond to this? One way was the kind of triumphalism that you saw in Vatican I. Um, the sense of, these guys are wrong, therefore we must be completely right. And, and, it made the church highly suspicious of developments in the secular world. And of course, seeing what the secular world was doing to you know, Rome in 18, 1848 and 1870 made Pius IX all the more suspicious. His successor, Leo XIII, decided to counter these ideas in a little more constructive way. Now it's on May 15, 1891, that he publishes Rerum Novarum which critiques the social and labor injustice of the Industrial Revolution. And it's the formation, you know, it's the basis of our modern Catholic teaching on social justice. It's interesting, just two months before that, he issues this letter on the refounding of a National Astronomical Observatory at the Vatican, that everyone might see that the church and her pastors are not opposed to science, but they embrace it, encourage, and promote it. So, the Vatican Observatory takes part in the 18-nation Carte de Ciel photographic atlas in the 1890s, <coughs> sets up a, a, a lab that starts an international journal in Spectrochemica. Today, continues to work in uh, the International Astronomical Union. We were involved in demoting Pluto, but that's another story. <laughs> Given all of this, description of Jesuit science. What can we say about the nature of science when it's done by the Jesuits? In particular, what were and are the particular advantages and disadvantages that being a Jesuit gives the young man who wants to be a scientist? The first is, of course, the Jesuits offer an education to a young man regardless of the family wealth or social status. Kircher is the youngest of nine kids from a clerk's family. But by being a Jesuit, he gets the chance to become one of the most learned men of his generation. McElwainy was a high school dropout because of the education the Jesuits afford. He can become one of the great founders of modern uh, geophysics. But even more than that, being a Jesuit fostered and supported scholarship in and of itself. So if you want to be a scientist, or if your superiors, your superiors not only allowed you to be a scientist, they encouraged it. And even if you weren't sure you wanted to be a scientist, they, Jesuits, might point you as a way that maybe you're good at this stuff. Maybe you could consider this. But it was more than just education <coughs> with fraud, as we heard this morning. 
Every Jesuit trained as a scientist is also trained in the rhetorical arts to communicate and converse these discoveries with other people. Communication, conversation is the heart of what it means to be a scientist. Another thing that being a Jesuit gave you was the chance to have foreign travel. Acosta is able to write about South America, because Acosta had been in South America. Going to South America in those days was about as rare as going to, into space today. Most people didn't get to do that. Certainly, most people who wanted to be a scientist wouldn't get to do that. He sent them. International cooperation goes further. It means you've got this ready-made network of other people who are scientists who speak the same language, not just Latin, but the same background, the same education, you've got the same interests, and you can see your fellow Jesuits not as rivals, but as collaborators. You can do the kind of science that needs a far-flung network. So Jesuits are going to be in the forefront of meteorology, seismology, astronomy, all of these things relying on observations made simultaneously at different places at the same time. So Grassi can observe a comet and have a colleague in Germany observing the same comet at the same time and work out that there's no parallels. Galileo may have been brighter than Grassi, but he couldn't do that. He didn't have that opportunity. It also means that when you're someone like Secchi and you've got to leave town in a hurry, you've got a place to go. <laughs> <laughs> he had a welcome both in England and the United States. He could move into a local Jesuit community and immediately know how it works. There's the bulletin board. There's a list of jobs. <laughs> every Jesuit house is the same as every other Jesuit house. <laughs> and that kind of continuity in the face of political upheaval is actually priceless. The status of being a Jesuit gives you access to all sorts of resources, corridors of power, and I used uh, Oscarovich <coughs> convincing the Pope to say heliocentric system is okay as an example of that. It happens to me. I'm on a lot of IAU committees that I wouldn't be on if I hadn't been a Jesuit. How do I know that? I wasn't a Jesuit until I was 40 and nobody was inviting me to any of these. <laughs> Finally, because you're a Jesuit, you don't have a family to worry about. You don't even have yourself to worry about. Somebody's going to make sure that you're fed and clothed. In many cases, you're in a position where you don't have to worry about a three-year grant cycle or a six-year tenure cycle. And that means you're free to do a whole set of scientific work that may take 10 or 20 years to come to fruition. Or even a set of work that may turn out to be a dead end and you're not going to starve, or your kids aren't going to starve as a result. And so you find Jesuits making category, catalogs of flora and fauna, catalogs of double stars, seismic velocities, looking for patterns in terrestrial magnetic fields. There are a bunch of Jesuits in India who worked out the basic flora and fauna of all the plant specimens in India. It's the basis of how we understand plant life in India today. Look at the McElhaney's tables of seismic velocities. The work I do at the Vatican Observatory is a table of physical properties, uh, densities, magnetic susceptibility of meteorites, the kind of work that nobody else was willing or had the time or the patience to do. The, uh, the, the seismic, uh, the, 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 the spectral work done at the observatory over a period of 20, 25 years, another example of this. So, there are a lot of advantages that Jesuits had for doing science. But with every advantage, there's a disadvantage. Yeah, you get a comprehensive education. It takes forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, 12 years for ordination. A typical person gets a PhD by 25, you're setting up your own lab, you're going strong. There's a guy in my lab who just finished his degree, Bob Mackey. He's going to be the new curator of meteorites. He's finally in his own lab for the first time, having finished his Jesuit formation. He's 40 years old. And that makes, that's a big disadvantage. Likewise, Jesuit can be sent to exotic places. You can also be pulled out of those exotic places and told to do something else. Acosta wound up back in Spain as the rector of a Jesuit community. In my uh, 
province of Maryland, Jim Salmon was an expert on chaotic reactions in chemistry until he was asked to be the province treasurer. <laughs> some kind of chaos, I love it. The international network gives us the safety net, but on the other hand, it means we sometimes need the safety net. Why was Secchi kicked out of Rome? Only because he was a Jesuit. If he hadn't been a Jesuit, he could have stayed on, and nobody would have known. Nobody would have cared. The kind of orphan science that Jesuits do, like in the 20 years to put together catalogs, often means that in the immediate community of other scientists, people look at you and say, why are you doing that? The first time I presented my list of meteorite densities, a grand old man in the field came up to me and said, God, why are you doing that? Nobody does that work. That's why I'm doing it. And after 10 years, when we had a good enough collection of data, now everybody's quoting it, and my colleagues are getting grant money to do more studies. But at the time, it was, you're a bright guy. Why are you wasting your time you know, collecting leaves and doing flora and fauna? Classic example, Thomas Macaulay, 19th century Whig historian, writes about the Jesuits. The Jesuits appear to have discovered the precise point to which intellectual culture can be carried without risk of intellectual emancipation. <laughs> Being a Jesuit has a tendency to suffocate rather than develop original genius. And that's the attitude you find of a lot of people looking at Jesuit science. And finally, as we saw, certainly in the 17th century, but it's always over your head, the expectations of the church put strains on how we present our work. We are always going to be seen as speaking for the church. When we present our results, we have to be careful to do it in a way that's not going to embarrass the church. I'm reminded of a case that came up in my own field of planetary sciences. Carl Sagan, you may have heard of, big popularizer of the idea of life on other planets. He presented a lot of papers about the origins of astrobiology. One of his biggest opponents who got up and said, your astronomy, your biology is terrible, was a biologist named Lynn Margulis. And they had a series of really ferocious arguments in public, at meetings, which probably added strain to the fact that they were married at the time. <laughs> Um, they didn't stay married. <laughs> Jesuits need to recognize the constant need to work at preventing these kinds of splits. But it actually goes to a deeper point of what it means to be a Jesuit doing science, which is the motivation behind the work. The unspoken assumption of someone like Macaulay is that you do science for the glory it brings on the scientist. But Jesuits don't do science, or at least shouldn't be doing science, for personal advancement, but only for the love of the truth that the science can reveal. Any glory that comes should be reflected not on the guy who discovers the little corner of creation, but the author of creation. And if some of the glory is reflected on the Jesuit order or the church, all the better. Unlike the example of Sagan and Margulis, the union of church and science in the Jesuit order can be a fruitful marriage. As a Jesuit scientist, I'm very aware of the bigger picture of the church, both the faith that fuels the reasons why I do science as a way of contemplating the creator, and the dimension of faith and justice that encourages me to share my work with curious minds throughout the world. Like right now, we've got a summer school going on with 25 students from the third world back in Rome. I recognize that our scientific scholarship contributes to the good reputation and the credibility of the Jesuits in particular and the church in general. And I've had Jesuits who work in faith and justice who tell me that that's important, that the credibility we give them allows them to have credibility in what they do, just as the work they do in faith and justice gives me credibility to be a scientist. Father General Nicholas, who we'll be hearing from tomorrow, just last month wrote a letter to the entire Jesuit order emphasizing this point. I want to quote from it. Many new questions emerge from developments in science and technology, 
for example, in the fields of biology or physics. The awareness that we live in a world with limited natural resources, changes in the way of establishing relationships with others, the information society. Responding to these questions requires openness to intellectual reflection regarding all the fields of our mission, whether we work in universities, periodicals, social centers, retreat houses, or research laboratories, whether we're involved in the youth apostolate, parish life, or ecclesial movements, in whatever field, the intellectual dimension is a part of all of our ministries. This union of hearts and minds is at the essence of being a Jesuit and a scientist. Thank you.